get to spend a lot of time with first year, first generation students. Eager if off so dubious about the shiny new futures they're being promised. We spend hours together in classrooms, in office hours, yesterday night till 10.30. On some days in historical societies, dedicated graduate students and the grown-up me showing the 18-year-old versions of ourselves, these young scholars of color and immigrant global citizens whose legacies and college seats were never assured how bold and brilliant they are and can be. They stand here today with me. Their collective energy, their scholarly commitment fuels my own. I get to spend at least as much time bringing forgotten 19th century black organizing, the long history of the civil rights movement, to digital life with a 25-person research group that graduate students and I co-founded called the Color Conventions Project. So I'm deeply invested in commitment. Commitment to heed the voices of the past in the present. Commitment to the power of collective research. The power of the innovative humanities and the power we gain when we prioritize and sustain efforts to make sure that black, brown, poor, and immigrant lovers of learning are included at every level in higher education from our students to our presidents. I was one of these students, poor enough to be cold a lot, buffeted by shivering months of nonstop winter, staving off the no car, below zero, bus stop blues. I understand a bit about the challenges so many of our students, or our should be students face. And I also know if they and faculty like them take their place at our public and other universities, they will help to change the way we produce knowledge, transform who we reach, and reveal why it matters. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the south side in the news. My mom and I raced to see who would graduate first, her from college or me from high school. As a child, when she first went back to school, I got homework tales instead of bedtime stories. First a Russian studies major, she regaled me with legends of Catherine the Great and Ivan the Terrible. And she always read me Langston News. That justice is a blind goddess is a thing to which we blacks are wise. Her bandage hides two festering sores that once, perhaps, were eyes. I spent summer with my dad's two German shepherds and dad's books in an efficiency apartment right on Venice Beach. He slept on a pull-out couch and every night I assembled a cot that just slid into the closet. The whole place might have been 250 square feet, but I doubt it. You could say that we, like so many others, anticipated the tiny house movement. As small as that place was, he made sure that my world was expansive. Every summer was a reading seminar. Shakespeare followed by classic sci-fi and world religions. There was poetry, always poetry. My dad was a black arts poet and jazz. One summer was just theater. Garcia Lorca, Arthur Miller, Albie, Ibsen, and Baraka waiting for Godot, the Greek tragedies, Fugar, Genet, and George Bernard Shaw. All of this on a beach that was our front yard, flanked by Sheba and Heavy, the, the uh, German shepherds, who stayed by my side like sentinels. Books were the staple in my household, but you could not eat or wear them. So I got my first of many jobs when I was 11, selling pretzels from a cart I said I pushed from Coney Island. By my senior year in high school, I had moved out of my parents' homes and was working to support myself while taking AP classes and applying to college. So, when in college, I found out there was a job where I could read and write and hang out with cool young people the rest of my life and they would pay me for it, I said, sign me up. Teaching at one of the great Los Angeles liberal colleges, liberal arts colleges, allowed me to do just that for many years. But my commitment 
that married the public humanities and cutting edge scholarship, a commitment to building a team-based digital project that engages the way thousands of students across the country learn and what tens of thousands of people know what that really happened when I came to the University of Delaware, when the College of Arts and Sciences started saying yes instead of no, right? At which they did from the beginning, and when we launched the Colored Conventions Project. When we think about movements for racial justice in the 19th century, abolition and the Underground Railroad spring to mind. The movement features heroes, mostly white, many Quaker, who worked for the oppressed, bringing them freedom from slavery, our nation's original sin. It's a familiar, original narrative about American progress. It is, dare I say, feel-good, redemptive history. The Color Conventions Project shades things differently, highlighting African-American leadership and the black organizing that built institutions and demanded justice. The movement predates the founding of the American Anti-Slavery Society, the names we all know, the newspapers like the Liberator, whose names we can recall. It started in 1830 in response to an Ohio exclusionary law calling for residents to provide bonds and what were effectively registration documents to remain in the state. This and white mob violence prompted 2,000 black residents, according to early convention reports, to flee to Canada, feeling so unsafe in their own country that they left family members and moved to a more safe, more hospitable ground. The movement continued for decades into the 1890s when it branched off into the recognized precursors of the civil rights organizations that are active today. Far from ending with ostensible freedom in 1865, as the anti-slavery movement does, the history we know recalls, the convention movement highlights ongoing challenges and historical failures. Convention upon convention addressed an ongoing lack of educational equity, access, and opportunity. Discrimination in the workforce and discriminatory pay. Striking blacks from juries that acquit people, we might say, even when they're running with their back turned, shot over and over again by police. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a different era. The targeting, the harassment, and murder of black people at the hands of the state, and the state apathy when it occurred over and again by mobs and individuals renting their rage on easy targets. Scores of the most important African-American editors of black papers. Reverends whose names are still lauded by their congregations. Black writers we teach in our classrooms. They were active in the colored convention movement. Langston Hughes's grandfather, Charles Langston, attended 13 conventions over 25 years. His younger brother, John Mercer Langston, the founding dean of Howard's Law School and the first black congressman in the Congress from Virginia was just as active. Intellectual giant and NAACP founder, NAACP founder again, W.E.B. Du Bois's grandfather, Othello Burghart, was a delegate to the 1847 convention, a fact one of our partners from the University of Texas, San Antonio, found out. The most famous and the unknown, tens of thousands of men and women participated in this movement, united in a desire for civil rights and inclusive democracy, but heterogeneous in their thinking, offering complex and often contested ideas about how to get to the same place. The first 35 years of the movement occurred as blacks were violently excluded from political participation. In 1860, we, and by we I mean the male me of me, we could only vote in five of 33 states. Yet through the convention movement, blacks participated in a parallel politics, that is in a political practice actualized in the face of official exclusion, derision, and violence. Far from being unprepared to serve in state legislatures after the Civil War, as newspapers ruthlessly caricatured them to be, a whole cadre of black leaders were deeply familiar with the language, the issues, the parliamentary procedures, and committee structures of state and national service. 
Although they were almost completely unknown before our project began, conventions expanded. You might say it exploded as the Civil War came to an end, and four million enslaved people could move and organize in ways that were impossible in the South before. Scores of conventions convened in 1865 alone all over the South, in Tennessee, Louisiana, Georgia, as well as in California, all over the Northeast and the Midwest. In those years, they founded newspapers and colleges such as Talladega in Alabama, which was conceived of in an 1865 mobile convention, mobile Alabama convention, by men who were just enslaved months earlier. Though the American Missionary Association often gets the credit for the college's founding, it's these men coming together in the 65 convention, imagining a future for their children, which, which actually granted and initiated this uh, amazing undertaking, one that still lives and educates people today. As violence swept the country, committees on murders and outrages created reports to document how voting rights, church burnings, Black student intimidation and violence and lynchings were on the rise as millions of citizens were targeted and terrorized. In the four years since its inception, the Color Convention Project has created a research curriculum that has guided more than 1,300 students, researchers across the country in their exploration of this movement. Led by our national teaching partners, students in classrooms from California to Connecticut, from Alabama to upstate New York, have created hundreds of interactive visualizations. They've written cultural biographies about the songs conveners sang, the parliamentary procedures they followed, the speeches they gave, and about the delegates themselves, as they've created digital exhibits that include more than a thousand pages and images that uncover, narrate, and visualize this lost history. We've collected more than 200 national and state convention proceedings and made them freely available. When we began, only a dozen national conventions were available in a print collection that could sell for up to $2,000. Almost 900 transcribers, including those from historic churches that hosted the conventions, Civil War reenactors from a black regiment in New York State, black masons, and hundreds of other volunteers have joined our Transcribe Minutes project, helping to make these records not only available, but fully searchable for the very first time. We've held what we believe is the very first symposium on the color conventions at the Delaware Historical Society and here at the library at the University of Delaware. Graduate student co-founders, partners in building this project are receiving national attention for their work and are editing with me the first collection of essays that examine this organizing. By moving from the podium and the pulpit to the pews and then panning out to boarding houses, we are reincorporating women and their involvement in activism which had been excised and anonymized. This is a collective project that involves librarians and archivists. It involves students and teachers and interested members of the public across the country as partners in recovering the color convention movement, which itself was a movement that stressed collaboration and collectives advocating for change. The Color Conventions Project itself is changing the face of digital and public humanities scholarship. It's diversifying them, surely. That is critical work at a time when the country and the academy is actively deciding who has claim in our classrooms and in our country. And uncovering this history matters to regular people. We hear from them all the time. One favorite moment was when my brother forwarded a message sent to a group of men from the south side of Chicago, my home, who exchanged news stories. There is not much in the world that blows away yours truly, wrote Herbert Hardwick who my brother says may have played chess with my dad in High Park's Harper Square. However, I have come across something I had no knowledge of, the color conventions of the 19th century. My curiosity about black convenings, he writes, has simmered for too long. Now it appears many of my questions will be answered. It takes a commitment to innovation, ingenuity, and new institutional infrastructure to gather scattered, disremembered histories of our long civil rights movement and to make them available, relevant, and resonant to scholars and their students, churches and their congregations, community organizations and their constituents. 
and it takes an innovative higher education community that is deeply, structurally committed to the many of us who did not emerge from the overprivileged to keep our very democracy relevant and alive. I cannot tell you how happy we are, President and First Lady Asanas, to have you lead that charge at the University of Delaware. Thank you.